Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. This is Austin Linney here, and I have the pleasure of having Mr. Jack Gibson in the house. How are you doing, sir? Great. Thanks for having me, Austin. Appreciate awesome. the Thank- opportunity to serve your audience here. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on yours. Mm-hmm. So what I like to do with my guests is I like to have them kind of start their story wherever they want to and kind of shed a little light on who they are, how they got here, and then we'll go from there. Also, you know, I'll go back to probably age 19, where I actually had my only job of my entire life. (laughs) Um, Ever since then, I realized I do not want to work for anyone. I want to be in total control of my finances, my future, my income. Um, I was washing boats for a summer at a marina near my parents' house in Ohio, and I absolutely hated it. I was paid $5 an hour. I asked for a raise and he wouldn't give it to me. And I'm like, this is, this is the worst. So then uh, I guess it was, I guess this is a wage job. I, I kind of had two dads growing up, not in a, in a way I can relate a lot to the, the book, rich dad, poor dad. Although my, my real dad, he was the professional. He wasn't uh, broke by any means and he was good with his money and he taught me a lot. But on the other side of the coin, I had my uncle who had no children of his own. So he had his six um, nieces and nephews. And so I was, he was kind of like a second father, right? And he was the wealthy entrepreneur, the wealthy businessman. He had three different companies, uh, ran 500 acres of farmland, and then had an insurance book, and then had a tent table and chair rental business. And so I learned from him, you know, what it looked like to build businesses and how to build a, a multi million dollar portfolio. I learned from him what not to do too. He didn't ever stop and enjoy his money. When I asked him when I was a senior in high school, I had saved up you know, the money to get a, a World Series of baseball ticket. Uh, the Cleveland Indians were in like for the first time in, I don't know, 50 years. <laughs> I mean, so I had saved my entire, you know, what, 19 years of, of life. I'd saved up for this moment because it was a huge deal. And I call him up. I'm like, hey, do you want to go to this game? And he's like, no, I work too hard for my money. And I'm like, wow, like, are you serious? Like, I have probably this entire this game is going to drain my 50% of my net worth. <laughs> and you're stacking, you know, 500 acres of farmland and all this money, and and you won't spend, you know, a few hundred bucks to go to a, a game with your nephew. So um, on the one hand, it taught me, okay, it's great and it, to build it, but you also want to make sure that you're enjoying it. So, you know, I just took the the different components from my two dads and, you know, that's kind of how I have come up with my own philosophy on money and business and life. And so far it's worked out pretty well. So I don't know where you want to go from there. No, I love that. So don't have a job. What was your first, did you jump into entrepreneurship right then at a young age? Yeah. Well, at the time when I first got started in entrepreneurship, I was a freshman in college and I get a a flyer from another college student about direct sales opportunity in the health and nutrition business uh, as a multi-level marketing opportunity. I didn't know anything about it at the time. I had no idea how it worked, Um, but I was open enough with my mindset, which I think is so important that I took a look and I really analyzed and I looked at how the whole plan worked and the products and um, found out after taking a look, which I almost didn't because I was too skeptical, but man, that was a life-changing decision just to take a look because we've been doing that for 25 years and it's a, it's a pretty, you know, a pretty big business. We have a team of over 10,000 um, distributors. So, you know, it's, it's worked out very well, but during that time where I was first getting it going, this was kind of the real straw that broke the camel's back, made me decide I'm never going to get a job or wage again. I did uh, about 20 hours of real hard labor on my uncle's farm. I just, I was clearing out land that he had just purchased. And so I'm throwing all these logs and sticks off, you know, his new acreage. And it's totally, it's the worst, it's the worst work. I mean, I don't, there's not too many things that can be much worse than that. And he gives me a hundred bucks, you know, $5 an hour. And I'm like, 
are you, you gotta be kidding, you know, but he was so intimidating and I'm just this kid. And I, I didn't really realize like, Hey, I could have made a play and stood up for myself and, you know, said, Hey, I'm worth more than what I, what you're paying me. But you know, I didn't, I just took the hundred bucks. And then at the same week, like right when I got that, I made a sale for 200 bucks, a nutrition program. I made a hundred bucks in 15 minutes. And so when I looked and compared the two, I'm like, wow, profits are better than wages. Jim Rohn, the, the incredible business philosopher, maybe the greatest of all time that taught Tony Robbins, <laughs> what he said had a lot of truth to it. Profits are better than wages. So from that moment on, I dedicated my life to building profits and, and never getting a wage. You know, Jack, something that's interesting, I'm, I'm thinking here, I've interviewed over 500 people, and I'm thinking about like a couple guys that I know that are, to be honest with you, two of them are called rainmakers because they put together deals for high level entrepreneurs and investors. Mm -hmm. And they started out in Cutco. They, they, some of them are still in it. And you're, you're talking about what you did. And, and I'm thinking to myself, these are some of the most successful people that I know that started out, you know, in multi-level marketing or started out in, in sales or whatever you want to call it, this, this, this framework. And I think, you know, some of these companies get a bad name, get a bad rap, but, but I'm looking at the skills that are obtained, you know, when Jim Rome really matched that personal development with that multi-level marketing, he really created a machine that when you get it dialed in and you're working on yourself and you're getting going, I, I've seen it produce some, some real success for a lot of people. Well, you, you make an incredible point, Austin, and there's a lot of hate on direct sales companies. I mean, I see it all the time with other finance creators, you know, having started indestructible wealth for the last year, there's, there's, you know, legitimate, you know, finance creators that have really big followings. And so they have influence and yet they're hating on MLM. They're hating on e-commerce. They're hating on some really cool opportunities just because there's some bad apples in the industry, there's some bad players, they're bad companies, there's bad, you know, in any industry, though, has that element of corruption, of the dark players, of the people um, that are not out to serve other humans in the right way. They have the dark motives, right, to manipulate and to steal and to defraud. Well, that is just totally not looking at it with like any level of real, I think, mat maturity. It's not looking at it with the real benefits that extend well beyond the financial. So with what you're saying, if you really look at direct sales and Coco is not, a, uh, I don't think it's an MLM, um, but it is, uh, you got to grind it out. You got to knock on doors. You got to, you know, you got to hustle. And so even that, process of what they do in that business is hated on right it's it's like oh what a what a it's such a waste it's you're just manipulating people you're selling a product that's overpriced whatever you are learning some of the most valuable skills in these types of companies that will serve you for the rest of your life in multiple endeavors any endeavor that you go into if you have trained sales skills you have market marketing skills that you learn, gosh, you can write your own ticket. And so when I started my real estate company about six years ago, I mean, I sold 5 million in, in real estate within 10 months part-time. Well, why? Because I was learned sales skills in my direct sales business. I learned how to work with people, build relationships, um, serve other humans, treat people the right way and, and put deals together. And so uh, I think people are missing the big picture. And what would you say if you had to, I know there's a lot there and, and kind of everybody hits on the same ones. What would you say those top level, you know, top one or two or three skill sets that you've learned over the, over your career that have really helped you propel your success? Well, the number one skill is networking. And if you're in a network marketing business, you know, you're, that's the whole goal. That's the, everything is predicated upon, you know, building successful networks, you know, Robert Kiyosaki said it best, um, the wealthy or the rich, you know, they build networks and everybody else looks for work. And so when you have a business that in our case, the way I've always said it, we have a nutrition company that's disguised as a product company, but it's actually a personal development company. It's, it, it's real mission is to educate and to teach 
and to elevate the mindsets and the skill sets of the distributors. Because if you do that, then you're obviously they're more productive, they're more valuable, and they're going to be able to drive a lot more business. So definitely networking, uh, relate building relationships, um, sales skills, not uh, we don't ever seem to learn hard sales closes type thing. <clears throat> and that's not my style I don't like it. And I can I mean, I know you just the way you interacted with me. I know you you don't like the hard sell either. It's a build a relationship. Well, I, and when you, can I, I help think, somebody. I think the the number one thing I've seen with sales guys is like, they really harp like the ones that I don't like, they harp on like, this is the thing that you need instead of reframing it and saying, there's an opportunity for me to educate you and show you how you can do this instead of like, Hey, you have to do this. And it's like, that's right. why I tell my guys, like, when you look, when you literally take everything down and you boil it down, you're talking about like we're in the health insurance space. When you're in the health insurance space, you're in this space. It's really about educating the consumer on a situation that's an opportunity for them. And if they take it, they take it. If they don't, they don't. And, and vice Absolutely. versa. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? And, got, and it, they've got a problem. You've got a solution. And if they don't like your solution, they keep their problem or they go somewhere else to 100%. To because the pain point of that situation needs to be far enough, especially in the coaching space, right? Even dealing with addiction. You know, sometimes a lot of people have addiction, but it ain't that bad. Like, mm -hmm. you know, they're still functioning. So until the wife leaves them, until they lose their job, until they hit the wall doing 90, you know, they're really not going to be open to your suggestion. I just saw that yesterday. I, I had a gal that um, reluctantly kind of was, I wouldn't say forced, but really pushed in by her mentor to take my financial course. She's not interested, but now all of a sudden she is interested. She just got hit with a $250,000 um, tax bill from the IRS. That'll and wake you up. Yeah. That'll wake you up and say, oh my gosh, you know, I need to learn finances. I have a pain point. You know, what's interesting that you say that the guys that I, that you, I was just, I just interviewed my buddy who's a CEO of a health insurance company. It's these things, right? The bookkeeping, the tax, the health insurance. It's these things that we don't wake up to because they're not sexy mm -hmm. until we get hit. Right. And that's why I want to, I want to stay here for a minute because I believe money, revenue and wealth are two totally different things. No, I agree. Totally. And so can you walk us through your kind of like delineation of those two things? Yeah, you know, actually, I just posted this on LinkedIn today. There's a big difference between, um, you know, having money and and being wealthy. You know, having having money means that, you know, and mo for most people, <clears throat> the money comes in, and then it's already spent. It's already going out the door to liabilities. So what most people think, right, is a, a their biggest liability for most um, Americans, their biggest asset, I should say, <clears throat> is their house. That's where they have most of their net worth is in the equity in their house right now. And it's the biggest liability that you can ever have. There's no cash flow coming in unless you're renting out, you know, your other bedrooms on Airbnb, like what you could probably teach them, right? <clears throat> unless that's happening, it's a huge liability and the bigger the house I can promise the bigger the liability. I mean, the, when we upgraded our home, more stuff breaks, more stuff is, is more expensive and repairs and all maintenance, all that stuff just is, is um, that much bigger. So I think having wealth, to my in my opinion, is assets that create additional streams of passive income. It's having assets that can grow in value over time um, through the uh, the values that they provide to the marketplace. So when I go about, you know, coaching clients, the first thing that I'm trying to help them to understand is we call it the make, keep and grow it formula. It's real, you know, since it's kindergarten level, you got to make and increase your, your income. And that should be your primary directive because it's a lot easier to grow a, a, a wealth and to grow abundance in your finances as your income scales. So what, instead of spending a lot of energy and time and thought process, figuring out how, like, how can I grow $10,000, you know, through investing. And I just had this question from a young kid, you know, on Instagram last week, I said, you're just looking at this the, the wrong way. You should be focused on all your efforts should be focused on increasing your income because you're not, there's not really much you can do with 10 grand. Like, yeah. What do you the number do? one question when I meet a client, this is what they say to me. This is their first thing. I've maxed out what I can do at my job. 
No, you haven't. No, no you no. haven't. And you know what's you know what we're selling people and it drives me crazy. Try this entrepreneur getting a car loan. Try me getting a house loan. Good luck. And I make good money. And mm -hmm. so you're looking at your job the wrong way. It's a vehicle and you haven't maxed it out to get you the loans necessary to buy the assets to then allow you to leave your job to create cash flow to create freedom. And then you move into the entrepreneurship. We're selling all these people. It's so cute to be an entrepreneur and, and start these businesses. But if you talk to Andy Frisella or the big guys, like some of these things take five, six, seven, 10 years to really create the wealth necessary because you're continuing to invest in the business. And nine times out of 10, I'm looking at it and going, you haven't maxed out your W-2. I totally agree. In fact, I don't think entrepreneurship, I think people need to go into entrepreneurship if they do, because so many people promote it as this, you know, um, wonderful, incredible thing. And it, it does, it is wonderful, incredible once you've built the business up, but I haven't taken a paycheck in my real estate company in six years. I've, I've not ever taken, I, I take that back. The very first year I took like 10 grand out and that was it. And then ever since then, I've just been, I mean, I put that 10 grand back in yeah. and then, you know, another few hundred grand to help to grow it up. I still, to this day, as an entrepreneur, I haven't been paid from that company. So how See, these are the conversations I just talked to my buddy when I saw him, they bought $70 million worth of real estate in the last three years in multifamily. And he hasn't got paid in three and a half years. Like not shocked. Yeah. You know, and it's like, to hear it. and it's like, he's like, that's the stuff that people don't talk about because what you're saying is if you don't set yourself up for success, the anxiety of not getting the money will force you into making decisions that you shouldn't be doing in the first place and get you off your skis. You have to have a long-term perspective in building a business. And I think, you know, anything less than a five-year perspective is probably too short because there's so many things that can go wrong and the, the learning curve of, of, you know, getting into a, a business there's so many things that you don't know. There's things that you don't know that there's dangers. Like when I started Indestructible Wealth, that I had no idea that some random guy would copy my entire handle, act as if he's me. He changed. The only thing he did, everything's identical on my Instagram account of what he copied. He just put three underscores at the end of my name. So people aren't, you know, he's messaging all of my followers this entire week, right? to, um, I don't know, he's trying to scam them or something, but I didn't know that that was a part of the challenges or one of the dangers that I was stepping into. So there's so many things that, you know, that you walk into a business and you have no idea what you're up against and all the things you've got to learn. I mean, just indestructible wealth. I've been doing this. I launched my podcast a year ago, May, but I, I actually started building it out a year ago, January, mm -hmm. I haven't taken any money. I haven't made any money in this business. Mm -hmm. All I've mm -hmm. been doing is shelling out money, pouring money into it to grow the, the, the asset. And so you just, you got to go into businesses with the right perspective. I think. I saw a guy yesterday was talking about people are looking at content the wrong way. And he was talking about podcasts in particular. And he was saying that like the quantifiable data on your ROI doesn't exist but it's, it's goodwill in the community and slash so, show, social like record, right? Of like, you know, I've got like, you know, 3000 videos, right? Give or take, maybe more, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. And so like, you know, as much as it is advice and help for people and they've changed because of it, it's also a barometer for me to see how far I've come. You know, if I go back and look at episode one, I'm like, <laughs> who was that kid and what was going on? Like, you know, and so it's like, for me, it's kind of a measuring stick. I kind of like it. It allows me to document my journey. And and so, you know, when you're talking about, you know, your podcast, Instructable Wealth, like what, in your opinion, what is the definition to Instructable Wealth in your eyes? So there's two parts to, you know, the meaning behind Indestructible Wealth. So in, in wealth, if you go back to the origins of it, and I don't want to give a, you know, a history lesson here, but the real meaning of wealth was well-being. It, it's, it's not, and that's the original intention. And what does well-being mean? Well, it just means well-being of your holistic life, your whole life. So all parts of your life, which you have your spiritual relationships, financial, physical health, and then your intellectual, mental um, knowledge. So those are the five major areas of your life. So it's, 
it's having a holistic wealth in all five areas. So when I say indestructible wealth, um, obviously most people are going to the finance only, but the real meaning behind it is how do we create this abundant life where in all five areas of our, our lives that you know, we're more balanced, more holistic in our focus. If all you do is focus on, say, you get rich, but you're living alone in the mansion because you're such a dick, what do you have? You have misery. You have uh, a lack of purpose and meaning and fulfillment. So I wanted um, indestructible wealth to be something different. Now, as far as finances go, nothing is truly indestructible because, you know, for example, I just had a guy on my show a couple months back, James Ray. I uh, followed him. He was on Oprah twice. He was in the movie, the secret. He was the main speaker. Um, he made, he was worth 20 million at one point had a tragic accident and then he's down negative 20 million. Right. So what he, what one would have thought having 20 million was indestructible. It turned out that it very much wasn't. So I'm not naive enough to think that you can build up this wealth and then something can't happen that could destroy it and take it all away. But I want to make that as difficult as as, as humanly possible. Mm-hmm. So I want to have assets in multiple asset classes that are kicking off streams of income. And if I have multiple asset classes, then I'm well diversified, well protected, and I have an allocation of my investable dollars, my capital, that it's going to be very hard for it to go away. When the markets, the financial markets just plummeted, my, my net worth went down. It went down. It had, you know, it it had to, like, (laughs) unless you're a hundred percent real estate, which I'm not, Yeah, it went down a small percentage, but for those that all their assets were in stocks, I mean, I can't imagine how stressful that was or all your hundred percent of your money was in crypto. My God, that Mm -hmm. had to be, I have, I have a client, I have a client down a million. So yeah. Down a million? Is there a whole? Is there a whole? Yeah, he owns a crypto. He owns. He owns. He owns a crypto company. Um, His wife has a great job, and you know, so he'll be fine. But let's just say it's stressful, and uh, you know, and it'll probably bounce back and be great. But but you know, a lot of what we spend time with right now is making sure that his health is dialed in, so he's not letting that that pressure of it being down, you know, and kind of, uh, making a bad decision. I'm actually very excited about his outlook on life because it's funny and not a lot of people will get this, (laughs) but it's kind of a great place to be. It's either going to be really great or it's all going to go to shit. Yeah. (laughs) Either way he's running, he's running, he's at least betting on himself. And I know that's a weird thing. And a lot of people don't understand that. But he has backup options if things. So he's willing to ride this out and see where it takes. You know, my portfolio recommendation, and this is obviously there's so many variations on this and opinions, and everybody's got what they think is the best way. So I believe that my way is the best way. So I'm just going to preface it with that disclaimer. But I believe about at least 50% of your total portfolio should be into real estate or very safe assets that can kick off income and that can appreciate. Mm -hmm. So I like about 50, I think about 50, 60% of my total net worth is in uh, real estate, including um, rental properties. We're really making a huge push right now and turning our, transforming our real estate company into a short-term Airbnb um, company. So we're in the process of, of acquiring new homes and selling off homes that don't fit that model. So it's a major, major shift. And then self-storage. It's just, I want assets that are even recessionary type yeah. periods are going to be really, really difficult for them to lose money, to get their cash flows, you know, completely disrupted. And then as far as crypto, I have my opinion. And I think some people may say I'm super conservative, but I think a 10% allocation into crypto yeah. is, is pretty strong. I, anything too much more than that. And you're just, you're at the whims of something that is completely volatile and that you have no control over. The biggest change in me as I'm running up on 40 at the end of the year is everything I wanted to be invested in in my twenties was, was the sizzle. 
and on the stake. And now yeah. I want to get invested in the most boringest things that are never going to go away. Lower, you know, storage units, mobile homes. And somebody asked me the other day, if you could start over Airbnb, what would you do? And I said, I would start a cleaning company. And it's, it's funny when you get older, you don't need the fanfare. You don't need the, the accolades. You just want to get in an asset. That's why I love that I'm, uh, you know, I'm part owner in a health insurance company that's trying to change health insurance because we're in a sector that no matter where we are in the economy, we're going to be making money. People have to have health insurance. And so these are the things that they don't teach you when you're younger that I wish I could go back and, and start over again, but, you know, invest in your life insurance policy. And the way that we have our portfolios, this is how we have it structured. 40% goes to us to, to pay our bills and, and live the lifestyle. And then another 40% is invested in longer term assets that are more safe. And then, you know, 10% is profit first. And then the other 10% goes to taxes. Yeah. And I mean, that's the way to do it, you know? Yeah. That's a, uh, and you're, you're never going to get into financial trouble with that sort of plan. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely, I, I mean, I love your, your strategy. In fact, like one of my, I'd say about 10 to 15% of my assets is in high cash value, whole life insurance. And that's hated on as well. And I, and I understand some of the plans, a lot of the plans are uh, stacked to where the commissions are so high up front that it, it takes a long time for those policies to really catch any momentum. And I, I understand there's some valid, you know, reasons uh, behind the hate, but, you know, if you have a properly structured plan, then that's good for you, the, the buyer, not just for the, you know, commission rep, that's in form of indestructible wealth. I mean, those haven't, failed they haven't failed in what 100 years 150 years a lot of these life insurance companies are stronger than they're stronger than our government they're stronger than um in its opinion and uh stronger than banks for sure so well wow. <clears throat> that's a great place that, for, for me well, this is the mind. thing they don't tell you like i you i'm sure you know this but did you know that a health insurance company has to have almost 10 times 20 times the amount of cash on hand than a bank I didn't know that. That makes. But they're sense. allowed. They're allowed to take their allocation and invest in certain assets. Is Thank you know, you and so man, when you start digging into this stuff, you know, and and there's a guy I love. His name is John, uh, Doctor John D. Martini. Uh, he has an amazing wealth seminar, like almost eight hours of just like the best seminars on wealth creation and saving money and everything. And he talks about how uh, if you study health insurance businesses, they do an automatic payment. Because they found out if you do an automatic payment with your health insurance, you're like 90% more likely to pay. And so trust me, the health insurance is always getting their money, right? And so mm -hmm. when you start studying these things, and I work private equity, and you start, you really uncover this other aspect of money that you really didn't know. Like, I didn't know that our hard money company or private equity company was getting their money from Blackstone, like, you know, 80% of our money. And then when COVID hit, Blackstone stopped lending money, and then our money dried up. So like, these are things that like, you know, when you start digging into more layers of money and understanding how, you know, that was really my education was understanding how money actually worked. You know, they're getting the money at 6% and they're lending it to investors at 11% and two points. And that's when you really start understanding the aspects of money. You really, I really didn't know it before then. So don't you, so what do you see? And I can give you what I see, but with the people that the younger guys that love the sizzle, right? They, they're attracted to the sizzle. They want to get the Amazon the, stores. Yeah. Yeah. They want that. They, you know, I had a gal who messaged me and she's having trouble with her, you know, Amazon store company and she's had her money in it 40 grand for, for a year and hasn't had anything happen yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I just told her, I'm like, look, you're, you you got to take responsibility for this. Mm -hmm. You, 100%. you got something that was a risky asset. A digital asset is going to be very risky. So you, you got into something that you really didn't understand and you didn't, it wasn't a safe, you know, asset that's going to be here a hundred years from now, like a house or a storage facility or, you know, all of the a real estate property. So I think that the, the reason they're attracted to the sizzle, like I was just like you and I was 22, you know, I was all in tech stocks and lost half my money. We want, humans want to get they want to make the most amount of money for the least amount of effort. And when they see the sizzle, that's their sign. I can 10 X my money quick. Well, it's, and I can... the, it's the same space in Airbnb. It's the same yeah. thing in Airbnb. This is, this is the, you know what, you know, my biggest issue, cause I've coached many and, and, and my biggest issue the, to kind of package it the best way. Everybody's in love with the gross. They don't pay attention to the net. Yeah. <laughs> that's the life. That is the quintessential right. motto for life. 
here's my wholesale company. I'm making $300,000 a month. That's what they say, right? But yet mm-hmm. I've looked on the inside of them and your your spend is 275, mm-hmm. like, or 280. Like, yeah. you're, you're not making, you're making like 2% margins. So like, my question is, say I have the same issue in multifamily. I'm invested in a thousand units. How much of a percent do you own? 0.0001%? Or do you have my buddy who's in Kentucky who owns a 50 unit outright by himself and he's financially free for the rest of his life? You know? Just from 150 units? Just from 150 unit, right? Yeah. I have another friend who owns 48 units in Memphis that if they get 14 people, they bought it so well, if they get 14 people paying their rent, they're, they break even. So what does that look like? 48. Mm-hmm. So, so you're what does protected. That look like? Yeah, exactly. That to me is a form of indestructible wealth. I mean, that's very, very difficult for the market to turn to a point of which you're not going to be making positive cash flow. Mm-hmm. And so the question that you have to ask yourself to, to really start this process mm-hmm. is, are you buying off of ego or are you buying because it's important? Here's my biggest issue. And this is my kind of statement that I make. Too many people in real estate investing in general are investing to get out of something instead of investing or enhancing their life that they already have. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to leave my nine to five and hit that Airbnb windfall so I can leave this job or I'm going to leave my job and go be a flipper. And all you did was create another job for yourself. I told everybody in my new book, there's a section on house flipping. It's really quick. I said, don't do it. Dude, my buddy, he is the top bet surgeon on the West Coast. The West Coast, you can imagine, lives in Hollywood Hills. And he's like, well, I'm going to go do some flipping because that's what people told me to do. And I was like, uh, no, you're not. That's the that's not going to happen. And so he's good. Well, what should I do? I said, well, do you know every doctor on the West Coast? Well, of course. Do you think they want to invest in real estate? Yes. In the last nine months, he's closed almost 700 units of storage unit and multifamily. I'm like, there you go, buddy. Boom. And he left his job. I'm like, yeah. boom. You know, that yeah. I gave him the permission to say, no, that you're you're up here, you're higher, your life experiences are higher than that. And they can correlate over to real estate more than a book is going to tell you. Yeah, you should. I don't think anybody should be flipping homes unless it's something that you really love to do and that you're passionate about and you're willing to, you know put in all the time, energy, and money that potentially it's not going to work out. I mean, I I just, I don't think that, I think for what most people are looking for is they're looking for lifestyle. They're looking for Mm -hmm. passive cash flow coming in every month to where they have options to whether they can work or not work, go on the trip, give to charity, live, reinvest the money into more assets. That's what they well, really want. Why we get out of here. I got to tell you this funny story about my dad. So my dad was a dentist for 46 years. He's in a group that Dan Kennedy coaches and like everybody in the group either sold a business or were high professionals. Like they all invest in, in a group of passive income, like everything, right? right? Like, uh, you know, storage units, all car washes. Mall, and he's been doing this for years, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't know much about it because we didn't have much of a relationship just for the last year. And uh, he says, I have to go speak at this conference. And like, 15 guys are speaking and you have to talk about your portfolio, right? My dad's been running a very, you know, labor intensive dentist office for years, right? So he was invested for 20 years passively, like literally 99% of his profile was passive. And, you know, everybody's speaking and they're like, you know, I'm actively invested 90% and I'm doing this and I own this business and I'm doing that, right? And he's like, man, this is going to be so embarrassing. Like I'm going to go up there and my whole portfolio is passive. When he got done, Every single wife of the guys that went up in spa said, can you come talk to my husband? I would love for him to get more passive. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, Yeah. because you, okay. So for most people that are strong earners, they already have one thing that they're doing to get their income that they're really skilled in and they build up over many years, their professional expertise. Right. And then to try to then go and do something else where you're generating earned income for it's not the easiest transition. There's lots of room for mistakes. You're probably in all likelihood, you're going to detract from the earning power of your main deal, your main gig. Mm -hmm. So you're going to end up losing money overall because you could have been just hyper-focused on what you're really good at, live below your means and take that investable dollars every month, start plowing them into safe, secure cash flow producing assets. And then 
And this is the part where you can do the sizzle. This is the part where it gets fun. Take your streams of income that are coming in that you now have a incredibly solid foundation that nobody's ever going to, they're not going to be able to take away from you. It's going to be very difficult for them to do that. Take those streams and buy the sizzly crypto that you think is going to tech 10x. Yeah. Use the, get the tech stock that you think, man, this could change the future. Get the pre-IPO company, the private equity type deal. Use your streams of money. So you're playing with house money and then you de-risk yourself so that you don't, if those don't work out, no big deal. My income is replenishing next month. I'll just fire right back away. I'll buy the next, you know, crypto that I think is going to pop and you move on like that. That's the way that I think that you create true financial independence and really massively scale a multi-million dollar portfolio. I love it. Wealth class 101. But if you want to find out the podcast, they want to check out the book, how would they do that? My site, myindestructiblewealth.com. I've got um, new brand new blogs that I'm I'm uh, writing myself. They're, they're I think they're pretty good. I've got my podcast right there on the link and then they can grab my book. And then I also built two financial courses depending on where they're at in their journey. There's the um, Indestructible Wealth Builder, more of a beginner type of program. And then the Advanced Indestructible Wealth Builder, which is more for six-figure earners that um, teaches you how to create the multiple streams of income from all these different asset classes. I love it. Guys, if you got some value from this episode, send it to a friend and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.